It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 40, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. My guests today are Jess and Brian Powers, the owners and operators of Working Hands Farm, with four acres of vegetables and a bunch of livestock just outside of Portland, Oregon. In this episode, we talk about how the farm got started in 2009, the ways they've worked to evolve their CSA and something more sustainable for themselves and the farm, and the relationship they've developed and nurtured between themselves as the farm grows. There's a lot of great information here about land access, working together as a couple, and the creation of a farm-centric rather than a customer-centric CSA operation. And Jess and Brian are two thoughtful, inspiring farmers who brought everything they've got to the show. Plus, how they met is a pretty darn cute love story. I had a lot of fun talking to Jess and Brian, and I learned a ton. Thank you for joining us today, and enjoy the show. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Vermont Compost, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality composts and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSAmerica.com. Jess and Brian Powers, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Thanks for having us, Chris. Thanks, Chris. It's so great to have you guys here today. How's the, the weather out in Oregon in, in November? You know, I grew up in Seattle and I but I don't remember like what November's supposed to be like in the Pacific Northwest anymore. It's been a long time. <laughs> Well, it's been really different since I moved out here in 2011. Uh, right now, currently, the last two days have been absolutely gorgeous. Uh, but, you know, the last few days of October, we had a couple inches of rain and, you know, a 48-hour period. And uh, it went out with a bang. And November is kind of starting out with blue skies and really nice weather. And, yeah, couldn't be more excited about what the, the month of November brings. And are you guys still out in the field harvesting crops? We are. Yeah, we we run a 28 week season CSA. So we have four more weeks left and then we also do a winter CSA for 18 weeks. So right now it's kind of taking in the storage crops and, you know, getting everything all set up for winter production in the greenhouse and the winters are relatively mild. The winter CSA is, is new to us this year, where we, in the past, we've kind of done extended fall CSAs and s separated it from our spring and summer. And then so the, the winter CSA is kind of a new endeavor for us, although we've grown for ourselves in more of a homestead capacity in, in the past couple years. And so we're, we're kind of getting geared up and excited to launch into that new endeavor this year. That's really exciting. The, I think the winter CSA is... Um it's got a lot of potential. What have you guys done to kind of take the edge off of the summer so that you don't, you know, you actually do get a little bit of a, a rest? You know, you're supposed to use that to level things out instead of just ramp up the amplitude. That's uh, that's definitely that's definitely the idea, and we're we're hoping that's the case. This this year has actually been just a tremendously dry and hot and long. I mean, it's been 90 degrees since the early spring, and it, and it just really the heat has only subsided. You know, it feels like they turned off the microwave fairly recently, and uh, and then so kind of in reaction to that, we decided going forward, and we're still and we're continuing to decide that we might try to you know see if we can tamper the workload in a, in a small way. And then so next year, possibly, you know, shrink down the size of the CSA or keep it the same. So not expand the CSA and then also have that ability to, to grow through the winter. So it hopefully moderates the workload. Although knowing Jess and I, uh, sometimes, you know, <laughs> if you raise the bar, we just keep trying to meet it over and over again. So I'm, I'm hoping that that will be the case. And, and then the other benefit of the winter CSA is, is by not having that and it being a financially viable farm, uh, when you add that on, the first thing I start to think about is, well, that could cover the salary of, a, of our first employee. And so that's something that we're kind of in a conversation with, uh, with each other about as well. So I think that's actually a really good spot. Let's back up here and, and kind of set the stage okay. for Working Hands Farm. Can you tell us about your acres and, and exactly where you're located and how that's relative to, the, to Portland, Oregon and how you guys are marketing your produce all around? Absolutely. So uh, currently for the last three years, we've been farming on 40 acres in Hillsboro, Oregon. Um, 
four acres uh, are in vegetable production, and we have about four acres in cover crop. Um, there's about five acres in riparian area and 27 acres in uh, pasture for the the beef cattle that we raise and the, the pigs that we raise, the heritage breed pigs. Um, and so we offer the 28 week season for vegetables, which is kind of like the bread and butter of what we do. It's at the heart of everything that we do. And then everything else is kind of, um, over the last three years we've integrated into the farm. Um, and especially on this property, getting to know it over the last three years and, and, you know, before we were here, they raised dairy cows on here and beef cattle. And um, it's really rich soil, um, beautiful loam. We really just lucked out. We've been just building up that soil and really seeing the benefits of paying t- attention to what um, the inputs are and, you know, growing better every season and just kind of listening to, you know, we get a flood usually in February in the back acreage, which... The organic matter is super high down there and, you know, kind of trying to figure out, well, pasture doesn't really grow the best down there. So what other, are there any other potential crops we could grow there in the future? And just kind of, you know, could we, we have that riparian area. Could we put the pigs on the other side of it? And we have uh, invasive grasses like reed canary that they're really great about mowing back. And so, you know, with the potential of being able to, you know, seed in some actual beautiful pasture down there for the cows to be able to graze on in the late fall because it stays uh, a lot wetter down there. Um, so we wouldn't really need to irrigate as much down there for for that area. So it'd just be, you know, just it's just been really fun to to find this piece of land and to figure out what works for the land and not necessarily what works the best for us. Um, and just to like work with nature in that way has been really fun to see it over the you know past three years to see it through all the seasons. And I just added, so we, we, uh, Jess was describing the location. We're about, we're about 20. Is that right, babe? Oh yeah. Like, I didn't even about, see that. 35 minutes, 35 minutes Southwest of Portland. And then, so we, when we found proper property, it was actually kind of by luck that we ended up finding this property, but we had been looking for property for for about a year and it was it, it kind of it was one of those things where we took Portland and we knew we wanted to stay around Portland partially because that's where our SA base was. So we basically drew a circle and we said we wanted to in an ideal world we could would be inside of 45 minutes from our ideal marketplace, which at that time we thought was Portland. And so we, because at that point in time, you know, we started in 2009 and as we developed, we did, I think what most farmers do, and we just prostrated ourselves on the ground and we said, how do we sell vegetables in any capacity that we can? So we offered everything from, you know, home delivery. We offered, uh, you know, two different, three different uh, pickup locations around the Portland metro area. We... I mean, we just, we did everything we could in order to sell vegetables. And, and as we kind of, I don't know, how would you say? Decided what, what works best for us. I don't know, gain that confidence <laughs> of being able to ask for what we need in order to sustain. Cause to be honest, you know, especially when we were like, well, the pickups aren't sustainable. Cause at that point, Brian and I had a dairy cow, which it <laughs> It doesn't make sense to get home at nine o'clock at night and milk the dairy cow and then eat dinner. So the priorities were starting to shift and it was like, you know, the more time that we spend on the farm, we're able to, to do a better job. So what can we do, you know, and then at that point we kind of look to our immediate community of like Hillsboro and Sherwood and Aloha and Beaverton and kind of just put on farm pickups as an option, which we hadn't really even considered, even though it was right under our noses. I feel like that was kind of the catalyst for a lot of uh, change on the farm for us. 
uh, it was really that thing where we, at first we went, okay, it's got to be, you know, within 45 minutes, one hour of the Portland metro area if we're going to survive. And, and that turned out to be true, except that we decided to pull out of Portland completely, which was terrifying because that was 50% of our customer base was people in Portland, you know, houses that we delivered to. And, and some of those members had been members since the very beginning. It, right. it, there just wasn't time in the day to, you know, it felt like we spent more time driving around, dropping off produce than, it, than actually growing the produce itself. And, and we weren't sure how that would actually accomplish our goal. You know, our goal is, you know, is simply stated is, is to, you know, provide the, you know, the best produce and meat that we can for our community to, to help in some small way to, to encourage them or better enable them to be productive members of society. And it is, and so, and, and how are we doing that if we're spending all day long driving in traffic? And so we right. did decide, you know, let's back up. Let's go ahead and just make it a more farmer centric CSA farm where the community, you know, where we're at the epicenter of our community and, and which was also scary because, you know, you're talking about a very different um, average well, you know, average income uh, in a, in a kind of our area out here. You're, uh, it's you know, it's, I think it's five or six thousand dollars less a year than it is in the Portland area. Um, okay. And it's although we're still close in, and we still have about twelve members that actually drive out from the uh, from downtown Portland area in Southeast Portland out to the farm. Um, but the vast majority of everybody now lives within about ten miles of the farm. Um, and then, and we get the benefit of kind of having an urban center. I mean, we've got a Home Depot and, and a, you know, and a hardware store and everything else. Uh, you know, that's just a, a little too close. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and so when you say when you say everybody, how many people is that? How many people are involved in your CSA? Um, this year we have about 110 members. Every year we've kind of grown in the last couple years by 15 or 20 members. So this year is. We're doing weekly membership and a new thing for us, which is biweekly membership. So it's the same size CSA. It's just people pick it up every other week, which has been great. People love it. So that's where we're at this year. And that 110 members includes both the weekly and the biweekly. Yeah, people. it's, it's uh, we combine. So <laughs> combine the two biweekly folks to make one weekly. So to, in total, there's 110 weekly shares, I should say. You know, it's always funny when you talk to people about how they're measuring their CSA, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it can really change rapidly depending on how you, you know, is it how many people are picking up every week or how many people are actually members. I remember 10 years ago <laughs> talking to somebody and coming to the realization that when they were talking about CSA members, they were actually talking about individuals, not families. And that <laughs> all of a sudden, the economics of that farm made a lot more sense. It's one of those things for us. It's uh, We keep track of it and it we we like to keep everything in pounds. And then so it's... It's, it's for us, it's how, you know, so we record uh, the size of our share and the average weight of the share every week. And then we combine it over the, uh, the entirety of the season. So we can say like uh, this year, for example, we're projecting to produce a hundred thousand pounds of produce over the course of the entire year. And the great thing about that is it allows us to do a couple things. One is that we can take that and divide it into the cost of the CSA. And last year, for example, we can say, Hey, you know, your CSA, although it seems like a lot of money up front over the course of the season the average price is a dollar and 67 cents per pound for your produce and that is wonderful you know i mean that is actually a spectacular deal especially for how hard we work you guys are you guys are really receiving every benefit of that and then right. and so and it also does help to kind of conceptualize how much produce it is and so with the weekly share i mean we shoot for somewhere around an average of 25 pounds average over the course of the season per share which is a lot of vegetables for some people and and it's almost nothing for for others and so for example jess and i could probably eat a share in, in you know a couple days you know for us it's four or five meals because we have a very veggie centric diet and we kind of have this expectation that our members are going to, you know, after two or three seasons, they're going to get there as well. And with the biweekly share, it allows people to, well, for the farmer, the wonderful thing about having a biweekly share, what we enjoy about it, is we don't change what we harvest whatsoever. So instead of having a small share and a large share, all the signage at the CSA pickup area, everything is exactly the same. 
so the members get the benefit of being able to pick up every other week. So maybe it's their first year and they're not quite geared up to eat this quantity of vegetables. And then whereas the, the older members will do, you know, more often uh, the weekly share, I guess all of them do the weekly right. share. And then, and then they're getting through their, their 25 pounds of vegetables, you know, by Thursday and they're, they're ready and hungry for more, but it, it certainly takes that learning curve. So tell me about how your on-farm CSA pickup works. Are you guys doing a are you guys doing a self serve pickup? So people come in and you say, you know, please take three tomatoes and, and a pound of carrots or how is that structured? So what we do is, uh, I guess what we started with is we used to pre-pack all of our, it used to be the most beautiful CSA shares, Chris. It was just, we, we would hand build wooden crates with a, you know, a burnt stamp in the side of it. They're just, you know, they just smelled of cedar. They'd make the whole house feel so warm and perfect crates. And then we'd just pack them full of veggies and we'd have them ready to go for everybody every, you know, at every week's drop, um, or uh, on the farm every week's pick. Pe- up and then so we had a couple uh, we didn't have a lot of infrastructure then so we had a couple farmers markets tents set up and people would come through in whatever weather and then they would you know chat with us for a couple minutes we'd be up there and uh, we'd give them their their crate full of veggies and we'd cross our fingers and hope that crate would come back the next week and through enough prompting and emails the crates usually would end up you know they'd dump the the gym clothes or whatever it was in them in the back of their car <laughs> and then uh, and then we get our crates back and and at some point in time, we just kind of decided, let's go ahead and move away from that. Let's take all of our crates and let's sell them to our CSA members so we can get a little bit of money for them, and, uh, which was a wonderful hit with the CSA members. And then and let's go and let's switch over to a more of a, a farmer's market style pickup where everybody comes through and then we have all the signs with the number of vegetables. We always use the language up to, so somebody can grab up to, you know, one bunch of carrots or up to, you know, I don't, two, of yeah, two bunches of greens, two bunches of kale, and then people make their way through. And, and the real power of that switchover, or the thing that we love about it so much, is that it started to really give the feeling of empowering the CSA members to make choices. Because some people, they've got a big family, and they want that, you know, that bat of a zucchini. They want that big zucchini because they're going to make bread, and they're going to make all kinds of different dishes out of it. And some folks want that really small zucchini that's ultra sweet. And then so we harvest, you know, a number of different sizes to kind of cater to people's individual tastes. Do you find that that balances out? I mean, do you ever end up with like the last person showing up and wishing that they could get a big bat of a zucchini and (laughs) and being denied and all there is these little, you know, beautiful, perfect shishi micro zucchinis? Exactly. Well, Brandon and I, uh, we, we usually harvest an extra few shares every day so that the last person, we like them to have at least three options for when they come through so which is which has been great no I think at the beginning people were a little bit nervous about switching over the market style because they might get off of work later than somebody else and they're worried they might not get you know whatever they wanted they might not get kale or something like that but that has never been an issue because Brian and I always make sure that there's plenty for everyone and plenty of choices as well and how many days a week are you offering pickups for the shares? We do three three days, so Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Wow, that's a lot of days of harvesting. Uh-huh. Are you harvesting fresh for each day, or is this something where you're maybe stacking things up by harvesting all the carrots on Monday or, or something like that? Yeah, we well, this year we've been doing a lot of, we do fresh harvest, so we'll do it between the two of us, it actually doesn't take very long. I, <laughs> we wonder, we're just really kind of in the zone when we're out there harvesting together and it could take, you know, three or four, up to four hours or something like that. Um, but this year, because it was so hot, you know, we were really hoping that we would be able to build a little bit more infrastructure and building a cooler was on the list. And once we knew that, you know, okay, this isn't going to work, this is too hot, you know, it's already May and, and stuff. Like, you know, there's only so much water cooling and stuff like that that you can do. So that became a huge priority in the beginning of June. And and basically, Brian and I went and got all the supplies for the cooler and uh, came back and we kind of went, what do we say, (laughs) divide and conquer. I just was like, all right, I'll get out there. I'll start tilling. I'll start planning. You just focus on the cooler. And I don't know, I think it took you about 
six or seven days to build the cooler. Yeah, so we ended up doing a cool bot, and uh, which has just been absolutely phenomenal. And then I think it's got an LG air conditioner on it, and it's been just rock solid. And we ended up building a 12 by 20 foot cooler. Um, and we have one air conditioner in there that I want to say is like 15,000 BTUs. And it keeps stuff down to like 34 degrees. I never, you know, which goes way beyond the scope of what CoolBot describes on their website. They, I think that's enough BTUs for like a, a 10 by 12 or uh, somewhere on there, even an 8 by 10. And uh, it's just worked phenomenally for us. So I have, uh, we're pretty excited about that. And we felt comfortable going with, um, you know, that size of cooler because a lot of the crops, you know, all we're doing is getting them as chilled as fast as we can. Can. And then so when they, you know, you get them out of the uh, harvest everything early in the morning, get it into the cooler so it can kind of crisp us and stay nice and cool because they're going to be pulled out of the cooler, you know, at 3.30 and then we're going to pack everything up and then just drive it on a trailer up to the front of the farm. And then, uh, and then we have a nice structure that we built this year as well for the CSA pickup. And then we set everything up on the tables and, and get ready to greet members if we have time to be up there. And if we, you know, on a busy season like this one was, if it's a, uh, we have, you know, carrots to weed and everything else, then we'll just go focus on that and give everybody a wave and tell them to enjoy their veggies and tell us what they cook and, and go from there. So talking about infrastructure, you've been on your current farm for three, this is the third growing season? Yes. So you started off renting land in, I think, 2009. Yes. How, so, well, which of course leads to like the real logical question of, so how did you find your way to farming? <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Jess, Jess, why don't you take this one first? Me first? Okay. Yeah, our stories are really fun. Uh, farming is actually what brought Brian and I together. So we weren't a couple before uh, we started working hands or anything like that. Brian had already started working hands, and it was and I was farming on the East Coast, and farming is what brought us together. And so, um, I don't know, I think my journey with farming apprenticing started in 2007. And so I kind of was working with a woman named Jean Iverson, who is now a, she's 96 now, but she still organically farms on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, which is where I grew up, grew up. And, uh, and that was just an amazing experience for me. And it kind of was, uh, between that and reading a lot of Michael Pollan books, um, specifically the omnivores dilemma, I was kind of thrown into, okay, I was living in Montreal at the time or before I met Jean, and I was just kind of at a loss for, okay, I grew up on Cape Cod. My dad's a commercial fisherman. I had access to all these beautiful fruits of his labor <laughs> in his garden, and it was kind of an idyllic little homestead that I grew up on. And living in the big city, I was kind of like – really thinking, okay, what is it that I want to do? You know, I went to college for communication arts and I was kind of following that path and like video production and stuff like that. And it just felt like something was missing for me. And so when I moved back to the Cape and met Jean, I was like, just, it just really opened up my eyes to, okay, don't be afraid, get out there, go meet some people in the community. Um, you know, I ended up going woofing across the United States and meeting a lot of farmers along the way who, you know, all had their different ideas about what community was and what was important to them. And, and it was just so fascinating to kind of take in all these accounts and, um, I farmed in Hawaii and then I came back east and was farming in Massachusetts and eventually I ended up back on Cape Cod and I was farming with my father who was stewarding a piece of property and you know he's a full-time commercial lobster fisherman so he's plenty busy so I just kind of took up where he left off and planted crops and started my own little farm stand what was that in 2011 uh, right before Brian and I met you know, I came at it from just like growing up with this mentality just to like eat what you grow and uh, enjoy being outside and being in touch with nature and just having somebody in my life, both my parents. My mom has a flower garden as well and has her own little flower 
cart. And so they really taught me to kind of get your hands in the dirt and just to be aware of your surroundings. And um, it was just really cool to get to a point, you know, after my freedom of going to college and everything else to come kind of back to my roots, so to say. And, and, and yeah, I'll let Brian chime in now about his story. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, I would, I would say, I would add in one of my favorite stories that Jess tells about Jean was, was uh, her, uh, you know, and I think, I think Jean is, you said Jess, 96 years old, and I'm not sure if she's still doing it, but, uh, but at the time we met, which was just a few years ago, she still had her big Troy built rototiller, and she was rototilling her garden to till all her cover crops in and getting ready to plant at 96, year old, 96 years old. It's pretty, pretty amazing. That's right. That's right. I knew that I had met the right lady to to begin this journey back again with farming when I met Jean. She's just kind of, I took her, I've taken her everywhere I've gone <laughs> with farming. And I think, and she started the Organic Gardeners Association on the Cape, is that right? Or she was, did in the 80s. Yeah, in the 80s. So, yeah. Pretty neat lady. She is. And how did, how did you fall into this <laughs> then, Brian? <laughs> I, um, I, I'm still trying to answer that question. Um, it is, I, so after I finished, uh, um, college, so I graduated with a, I'm a classic farmer. I graduated with a, with a BA in, in literature and, uh, from there got involved with, um, with some humanitarian efforts in East Africa and, uh, spent a couple years, um, designing fuel efficient cook stoves and uh, drilling clean water wells, uh, mostly focused on uh, Uganda in, in northern Uganda. And this was something, a job that I was really excited about out of college because it meant for the first time I was actually going to be making some real money. Um, but the priority really was for me to see what kind of difference I could make in the world to figure out what my place was. And uh, you know, northern Uganda is an amazing, amazing area. And, you know, I spent a lot of days out in the field drilling uh, clean water wells and, and designing stoves with just some amazing people in that community. And it was an agrarian-based society. And so I got to see the value of, you know, uh, shucking beans and spending all day shucking beans or sitting around and and talking about growing citrus and irrigation and the importance of water and you know i mean we we on kind of in side projects in our free time whenever which we didn't have a lot of it you know we would go and we'd plant corn with uh, some of our friends and and seeing the lack of irrigation and and just really hoping it's going to rain and and really being involved in a, in a culture that of course i hadn't experienced but you know it was a, it was a very intimate experience with me and i made some really really close friends that i uh, you know that i i value that experience tremendously but the downside of that was it was a really, for me, it was a very high stress situation a lot of the times. And it was something that I, I was pretty quickly getting burnt out on and I needed to find something different. Uh, through a couple of years, I ended up making my way back to the States and that was the beginning of the recession. And during the beginning, you know, I kind of had this idea that I had all this good experience. You know, I had been to all these different countries. I've managed a, a team. Um, that I would get back and I would get a job immediately in Portland. And, uh, boy, I didn't hear back from any, you know, I, I had a hard time getting interviews. I had a hard time figuring out what's next. So I signed up to go to school. Uh, and, uh, and so I got into a Portland State University a master's degree program for sustainability studies and kind of a focus on urban engineering. It was one of those times where I, it didn't feel quite right. It didn't feel, you know, I still had very much of a humanitarian heart, but I figured I got to be productive and I got to move forward. And so what's the next step? And so from there, I, I ended up stumbling upon, uh, you know, an organization that I'd worked with uh, called Aprovecho um, that designs, they've got two branches. They sort of have a sustainability institute, which is a, you know, a, cor a cob house in the hills. And they've got a big two acre garden that is, you know, no, uh, no implements, you know, no mechanization, just all hand dug. It's a really beautiful location, a beautiful property. And then they have the other site that is quite high tech and they actually uh, engineer fuel efficient stoves. 
I haven't kept up with the industry that much, so I don't know where they're at now, um, but they're doing a good job and making a big impact. And so I, uh, I decided to sign up for one of their internship programs, and I went down there and had my very first experience gardening on their their two-acre plot, and I just fell in love. You know, I mean, for me, it was I was so stressed out from my previous job, and I was really kind of dealing with some issues of a little bit of anger and just wondering what my place in the world was and, and really wanting to to have made a positive impact in people's lives. And when it comes down to quantifying that impact, you know, knowing that some of those wells break down and, and knowing that everything has a timeline on it and really having an honest discussion of what is sus- making a sustainable difference in the world, you know, I just, I wasn't as certain as I thought I should be. And so when I found uh, gardening, <laughs> yeah, I just, it was peaceful. Nobody bothered me. You know, I wasn't there to make friends. I was there to be a kind of a loner and and just oh, I, I just filled up my Amazon book cart on you know everything uh, <laughs> you know on every gardening book that's ever been written and I just I spent a whole summer reading and I actually ended up deferring my graduate program uh, I kind of decided that year that I just I, and they had a small CSA program I, I don't even know how many people it catered to but it couldn't have been more than a dozen and uh, and I said well that's the only farming model I've ever heard of and uh, I'm just going to start farming and so I got out there you know what year was that Jeff? <laughs> 2009. So that was 2009, and so I, you know, got my Carhartts on, and I got my <laughs> my fancy leather boots, and I, I walked, you know, I, I leased some, or I didn't lease, I rented on a month-to-month basis some land uh, nice. that was the first farm, and I grabbed a pitchfork and a, and a Maddox and a, and a push mower, and I <laughs> walked into a field that was with grass that was probably four feet tall, and I uh, I started push in and, and starting to till up dirt. And, and I just went, Oh my God, you know, I've got no idea, you know, the blisters on my hands after that first day of hard work all by myself out there. And I don't even know if I digged up 10 row feet. I mean, it was uh, it was a sharp learning curve. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. You, you just you just dove right in. Oh, I'm a diver. Oh, I, he's he's a cliff jumper. <laughs> he, he is. That sounds like something that just when you say it like that might be a little bit of a difference between the two of you. Oh, it absolutely is. That's that's kind of like the key. That's like our dynamic there. I'm a, I'm a bit more conservative. Um Brian always likes to say I just have a really strong work ethic, so I could just put my head down all day and just work where, you know, Brian sometimes, you know, he he calls himself the professional tinkerer. Like if he had his way, he could be figuring out how to problem solve everything on the the farm and, and to build the things that would help, you know, make the farm a little bit more sustainable or, you know, research the things and all this stuff, whereas I, I just you know, go out there in the day and kind of know what I need to get done and I'll just and do it. And so, uh, but I'm definitely a little bit more conservative when it comes to that stuff. He is, he's the jumper. He's the one where, you know, we said we were going to get animals and the first animal that we decide to get is a dairy cow, which is just, you know, the most ridiculous thing ever because it's like, you know, <laughs> this animal that requires so much and we just had no idea what we were doing. And we went to look at the dairy cow and he said, you know what, we're not going to get this one. We're just going to look. But in the back of my mind, I knew that he was full of it and he, he had already had, you know, the cash in his back pocket and, you know, we left there with a <laughs> dairy cow. So, you know, like he, he pretends like we're going to take things slowly, but he's not a slow, he's not a slow person. <laughs> Uh, it's funny. So Brian, you're, you're farming in here in 2009 on rented ground. This eventually changes into you farming on some leased ground. How do you and, and Jess get together? How does, how does that connection get made? Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. And so we, social media, Yeah, that's <laughs> right. And so, uh, basically how, how we met was, uh, well, you know what, Jess, why don't you tell the story? Yeah, I, I actually happened, so at some point in time with my woofing and stuff like that, I ended up in Portland for a short amount of time before Brian and I actually met. And one of uh, a fellow friend had posted on Facebook a video that Brian made. So I had no idea who Brian was. Um, it was right around the time that I was heading back east to start my own little farm stand. And it was this cute little video about, you know, all about the possibilities. It was just like, you know, the 
spring shots in the greenhouse with all the the little seedlings germinating and all this stuff and with a with a nice song and everything like that and that was kind of the first time I took notice of what Brian was doing because he definitely had um, his own little farm blog and an online presence that I was attracted to and that's kind of where I left it off I would check back periodically at the farm blog but we hadn't actually made a solid connection at that point and then later that season we actually I think I sent him a letter and uh <laughs> well I think what it was first is that I found her farm blog just the way that you do on Facebook so many you start a, a conversation over commenting on certain ideas of growing practices or how you do things and then I followed it back to her blog and I see this beautiful woman and she is just you know working her butt off and and her photography is absolutely stunning and and it's just this you know and I'm thinking you know like and I've got a lot of time on my hands you know I'm trying to figure out how to you know like uh, turn this uh, this garden into a, a financially viable farm and and, uh, and I'm thinking man I it would be really cool to partner up with somebody who you know has uh, has some more experience than I do and, and is pretty good looking too Oh, God. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, well, it's funny that he should say that because he never responded to my letter. So, um, <laughs> you know, and then the summer happens and you get really busy and all that. And and the place that I was farming on wasn't going to be available to me the next season. So what I did was I sent Brian a, I think it was on Facebook or an email, um, in 2011, I sent him a, a message that basically said, hey, there's a couple of things I want to talk to you about, like business kind of formulated questions. Uh, do you have any time? I know that, you know, I'm three hours ahead of you, so I'm sure we can find a time to make it work. And and we ended up finding a time. And then I think it was at like nine o'clock my time. So I was kind of tired, but we ended up talking about nothing related to farming and just kind of hit it off on the phone. I, and, I think it was South Korean film that we spent a lot of our time talking about and and uh and it really was one of those conversations where you just knew at that moment that it was you know you know, love at first sight so to speak yeah so it it was in september and and brian was pretty adamant about at that point he had had interns helping him in the season and he kind of ran out of money to uh, keep paying them so he was trying to convince me to get out there and help him wrap up the season and uh lucky for him a, a hurricane rolled through and kind of ended my season and so uh <laughs> i bought a one-way ticket and yeah i haven't been home since i guess i should say <laughs> so that was about four years ago that's pretty cute <laughs> The cute part is, is I like to joke that our first date was actually a trip to Uganda. Uh, my season at that time wind, uh, winded down in within a, uh, just a couple weeks. And I was, I got an email from a colleague that said that they, they needed a new stove for some vanilla bean farmers just outside of Kampala, Uganda. And, uh, and it was actually for uh, Kirkland brand, uh, brand uh, vanilla from Costco. And so we we, we dove in and I, I looked at her and I said, you know, I've got no interest in going back. You know, my roots are, are definitely deeply planted here. But if you want to come back with me for a few weeks, I could show you the country like nobody's ever seen it. And I was really thinking, you know, I mean, what an opportunity to, you know, I would lived there for so long and it was so integrated into the culture. I could take Jess on this trip where it would, you know, it would just, yeah, I mean, what a, I don't know. I, I just thought it could create a really wonderful experience experience for her. And then two weeks ended up turning into three months. And then we got a, a job or we, we kind of advocated for a job to by the man who was financing a, a local guy who was a, a very successful, who owned a, a company called Uga Cheek um, in Uganda. And, and he kind of said, so I heard you guys are organic farmers on top of being stove designers. So, so tell me about this organic farming and, and do you want to try something here? And so uh, a, a two week trip ended up being three months and we got a crew together and we started a little organic farm and or at least I shouldn't say we started we we experimented and and, and we got a chance to to show somebody what what we knew at that time which wasn't a whole lot about organic farming but it was something but but that ties into a lot of issues that you know I, uh, from our or my first experience in Uganda is you know I mean we had to figure out how to source 
drip irrigation, and I had never considered that, although I knew where to get a lot of raw materials in Uganda. It was, you know, I mean, you try sourcing drip irrigation. If anybody wants to, you know, make some serious money and, and doing some real good in people's lives, you know, get a container of drip tape and, and, and figure out how to start selling it at an appropriate price in northern Uganda. It would make a, a huge difference in a lot of people's lives. That's really interesting when you, you know, when you think about that. And a lot of people I talk to have a hard time sourcing materials here in the States, but really, I guess going overseas would take that to an entirely different level. Oh, Chris, it was incredible. I mean, we got black market seeds. We couldn't find seeds anywhere. <laughs> it was, I mean, and so a lot of, a lot of the seeds come, come out of South Africa and, and Kenya. And, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, you know, all of them are treated. And then, so if you want to find any, you know, a diverse varieties of seed and I mean, gather yeah, a lot of this comes out of a place for ignorance. I, I had not focused on farming there. That wasn't my, my, where my expertise was, but I knew that I, you know, it's. Uh, I knew a lot was produced in South Africa and shipped up to the the growing uh, supermarkets that were in Kampala, and and you know, with the pro- uh, proliferation of of cell phones and wireless connections and all and internet cafes, also comes you know so many you know mo- streaming movies and seeing what the whole world is eating, and then and then you start seeing you know uh, Brussels sprouts grown from the Netherlands showing up in the supermarkets. You know, like I mean, we're talking about large, extremely expensive supermarkets in the city. But sure enough, you know, I mean, I remember the new big thing was there was called yellow yolk eggs. And it was eggs that actually had a yellow yolk as opposed to a gray yolk because of the, you know, dried corn and soy meal. That was the base diet there for most of the eggs. So you'd actually get gray yolks. You know, so it's, it's an interesting world. Hey, we're going to take a short break here and get a word from our sponsors. And we'll be right back in just a couple of minutes. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by Vermont Compost Company, makers of living media for organic growers since 1992. In the transplant greenhouse, all of your investment in plant materials, heat, labor, and overhead depend on the performance of the media where you expect your plants to grow. And that media has a really hard job to do, produce a healthy plant in just a few cubic centimeters of soil. When I started farming, I focused on getting the cheapest ingredients I could find to make my own potting soil and later on finding cheap potting soil that was already put together. But I found what so many farmers have that saving money on inputs doesn't always result in increased profits. Jennifer at Vermont Compost can tell story after story of customers who switch to less expensive options, but who have come back to Vermont Compost for the consistency and the quality of their potting soils. And even though it's not all about saving money, Vermont Compost pre-buy program can help you get what your plants need at the best price with the best shipping options delivered at a time that works best for you. Plus, their shared truckloads program organizes shipping to other regions in ways that get shipping prices down to the level you'd pay right there in the great state of Vermont. Feed the soil. VermontCompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheeled tractors are often mistaken for just a rototiller, but they are truly superior pieces of farming equipment. Engineered and built in Italy where small farms are a way of life, BCS tractors are built to standards of quality and durability expected of real agricultural equipment, the kind of dependability that every farm needs. I've worked with BCS tractors for over 24 years, and I wouldn't consider anything else for my small tractor needs. And I'm not the only fan. More than 1.5 million people in 50 countries have discovered the advantages of owning Europe's most popular two-wheeled tractor. And these really are small tractors with the kinds of features found on their four-wheeled cousins and a wide array of equipment. Power harrows, rotary plows, flail mowers, snow throwers, sickle bar mowers, chippers, log splitters, Ah, you name it you can probably put it on a BCS. Check out bcsamerica.com to see photos and videos of BCS in action. bcsamerica.com. And now back to our show with Jess and Brian Powers. So then you guys came back and you farmed on on this on a leased piece of land for several years. It was actually it was actually rented. So we it was, yeah, it was the same piece of the same piece of land and it was a month to month uh, uh, rent. Wow. So you guys, really, you guys built your business on a month to month rental contract. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you continue with that before you invested in your own place? Four years. Yeah. yeah it, was, right. it was four years. That last year there, we actually were 
breaking ground on the new farm and we're kind of trialing out different veggie varietals here. Um, and then we decided, well, what the heck, let's just plant all our fall crops over here until we eventually trans- transition just to this property. But, um, yeah, that was kind of the last year that we were over there. Mm-hmm. We felt a lot of pressure at that time to, uh, you know, it being month to month and the farm actually getting quite serious. And, and, you know, and soon as Jess showed up on the farm, it really, you know, started to change from a garden to a farm. I mean, I was I was still, you know, bunching kale with twine and, and really focusing on a, a young uh, downtown crowd. And, and, of course, soon as Jess showed up, it was like, you know, you count out your rubber bands beforehand. You put them on your wrist this is how you bunch it and and i used to compete with her a lot and she'd be you know two or three bunches ahead of me every single time and she didn't know i was i was competing with her you know and (laughs) and so it really did start to change and as the business started to make more money and and become more and more profitable we're we're feeding people through a csa program so people are making commitments and we have to live up to those commitments we really felt the pressure to to find a piece of property and uh i mean what if you tell the story of how we found it, Jess. Oh yeah, that's a fun story. So we, that first year that we were farming full time together in 2012, um, we had a crazy bumper crop of tomatoes and a few other crops. And so we said, well, what the heck, let's set up a little farm stand because we're, we're pretty much on a main road here cuts through the country and uh, people drive pretty quick, but we actually had a lot of people stop for tomatoes. And so we kind of had a self-service farm stand. Um, And one of the older gentlemen that stopped by the farm one day uh, had to make change. And so he came over and knocked on the door and uh, started asking us, you know, do we own this piece of property? Um, what do we farm? You know, would we be interested in this property down the road? It was only a couple of miles down the road that hadn't even gone uh, for sale yet um, and that it was bought with like a certified check. So the, the guy who owned it just kind of wanted to sell it before he put it up on the market or whatever. And so Brian, of course, he goes, do you want to go check it out? And Brian's like, yeah, honey, I'm going to go jump in the car with this guy. <laughs> I'll hopefully <laughs> I'll be right back. Um, and so he ended up going with the man down the road and it, you know, it was just kind of serendipitous because we had been looking further out into the country because we just honestly didn't think we could afford anything that close to the location that we were already at. Um, and we found this beautiful piece of property. I mean, it wasn't beautiful at the time, uh, maybe beautiful in the same way. I think it was beautiful to me. It had a house on it that needed to be <laughs> torn down and uh, they were raising pit bulls on the property w- uh, when we arrived and it was, uh, you know, more or less uh, uh, it was it was a rough uh, it was a rough place uh, when we first got here in the last lease had been signed on the property on this 40 acre parcel was in 2009 uh, 2008 and then so it had been pretty much laying fallow for for a long time and uh, and just blackberries just grown up over an old dilapidated barn I mean it was it was a sight but for to me it was pure possibility so I initially, you know, I had to walk the whole property. I had to see what the whole thing looked like. And the best part of it was it was two miles down the road from our from our current farm. So, you know, uh, transferring our CSA members over to the new farm would be something at that time, you know, which would hopefully turn into the new farm, uh, would actually be a possibility. And maybe the best thing about it was it was 40 acres, but it was kind of mixed use land. And I don't say that zoning wise. I, I more so say that the bottom of it flooded out during the year. So we, uh, so the value of it to a commercial farmer on the, in the area just wasn't the same. Uh, so, you know, I would see it as 40 diverse acres where there's a lot of margins to graze different livestock, although I didn't know that then. Um, and I saw it as a beautiful, diverse piece of property, whereas uh, maybe a more commercial grower would look at it and go, well, I can't get my tractor into that area until the halfway through the summer, so I'm not going to try that. And and since the house was in such a bad condition, it just didn't have the same value to others. And as Jess mentioned, the, the man who bought it, bought it uh, on foreclosure with a certified check for $200,000. And then so I uh, immediately talked to this the man who introduced us to the property and said, you know, 
we'll come up with the cash. We'll figure out how to do it. You know, let's make an offer. And, uh, and we ended up just getting a smoking deal on the property. And, uh, and of course I walked Jess into the house and I said, Hey, this could be it. And she just looked at me and goes, no, it can't. (laughs) I'm all about possibility, but that was a bit of a stretch. (laughs) It's a story that I hear a lot from people who get themselves into an area is, you know, when you're, when you're someplace and doing something, it really does open up possibilities for land transfer because so much land changes hands without ever really going on the market. You know, it's a, it's a very word of mouth. And when you're doing something cool, people tend to be attracted to that. And I've, I've heard again and again about farmers getting someplace, renting land, and suddenly having somebody basically walk up to them and say, I know about this piece of property down here. So how did you guys put together the financing for the new place? Okay, so the financing, we basically worked like this. Um, We immediately formed an LLC uh, with our family and uh, in order to come up with the capital and uh, and the the financial history that would be acceptable to the to the lenders. And it was, you know, both of us uh, coming from uh, fairly humble means was uh, it was a big conversation and it was basically we needed to come up with the down payment and, and then although we did have some money at the time, uh, we needed a little bit of help in order to make it work and then we approached uh, a company that used to be uh, run by the government um, or a lender that used to be run by the government called uh, Farm Credit Services and who they really do focus in on getting farmers onto farmland, although it's a little bit more of a focus on a conventional system. Um, like for example, like we we had a dairy cow, and they were kind of like, "What's a dairy cow?" Um, and so they had become a little bit disconnected, I think, uh, from what we actually did uh, over time. But what they did is they organized a, a loan structure for us that was two separate loans that c- got combined into one, and it was called a uh, a land and construction loan because the lenders wouldn't actually lend on the state of the house because it just didn't have any value. And I think at that time it was seen more of a as a liability. Um, right. And then the, uh, the, the land of course, uh, was a separate loan structure. And then, so they combined those two loans and wrapped them up for us. And, uh, and we, I mean, it was a really good, good time to buy. Um, yeah, it definitely wasn't a seller's market. So we ended up getting a, a pretty good deal and the bank accepted our offer and, uh, and we were off and running. Did you guys start putting infrastructure in right away or was this something where you began farming that ground and then gradually installing what you needed? This was kind of the best part of of the whole experience is that we had the opportunity to uh, work with some uh, some of our closest friends uh, and uh, in the construction phase of the pro- uh, project. So I went to school at the University of Oregon in Eugene, and uh, and one of my closest friends from college owns a company called Tall Furs Building Company in Portland, and uh, and his uh, the, his father owned an excavation company in Eugene. And so we just rallied the troops, you know, we got everybody. So they drove all the heavy equipment up from Eugene and uh, Kip came out and we, we have, we had a, f- a family friend that um, it designed the house and designed our barn. And, uh, and then we, Jess and I did as much labor as we possibly could, you know, on, uh, on both, you know, so we were farming the old property and we had a full-time CSA going on there. There. And then in the evening, we would come over here and we would, you know, the the septic inspector, you know, after going through a winter of the entire permitting process, which could, could be another farmer to farmer podcast on its own, <laughs> uh, we we ended up digging, you know, hand digging our septic permit uh, pits, the septic test pits, and the, and the guy came out here and uh, to to look at the soil to decide whether we could put a septic system in or not. He looked at us and he goes, "Did you dig these by?" I think. I was actually still in one of the holes and he looked at Jess and I and goes, did you guys dig these by hand? And we're going, yeah, we couldn't afford an excavator and an operator. I mean, you're talking about a $3,500 bill. You know, do I look like I've got 3,500 bucks? (laughs) And, uh, and then, so we just, we laid all the conduit for the property. We, you know, I, uh, I would guess, you know, over the course of that building process, we probably put 75 to a hundred thousand dollars of sweat equity into the entire building project um, while maintaining a CSA farm on the other side. I mean, we, we worked from, yeah, we worked through the night on this place. 
Yeah, you wow. were tilling at night to put in the pasture. You, <laughs> That's right. We just tilled on our little, I don't know, John Deere tractor. It took you a few months to do the whole 30 acres of pasture, but we eventually got there. But he was tilling from, you know, 8 at night to whenever you would get home. <laughs> so maybe two or three in the morning and because we, we figured we needed to pa- plant pasture seed because we didn't know anything and we had to take care of the dairy cows. And, and um, so it was just, it was just nonstop. I mean, I don't think either of us have ever worked so hard in, in our lives, but it really set a pace and we figured out, you know, what we were capable of. And then, so with, with any extra money uh, that we had um, from the loan structure, we, uh, we invested in in infrastructure as fast as we could. And then, and then of course we built infrastructure ourselves, not that we were skilled builders, but we were willing to learn and and we didn't have enough money to do it. Otherwise you made that comment, you know, do I look like I have (laughs) $3,500 to spend on getting a, on getting a hole dug Um, in a hole knee deep in water. (laughs) I'm really curious. I mean, have you guys in the, in the intervening years, I mean, that sounds like a real, well, a hard scrabble beginning, which isn't unusual for, for farmers getting started. And I think any small business usually springs from some pretty humble, hard work. Do you feel like that's something that you guys have moved through? I think so. I think it was also the catalyst that after working so hard that year, it was kind of, okay, what do we actually need to make this farm sustainable? And so, you know, we're we're putting in roots here. And it started with our fall CSA it was the first time we actually asked for what we needed in terms of making the farm viable and just being a sustainable thing for both of us to be full-time farmers. And so, you know, we upped the price on our CSA. And when people asked, you know, yeah, we noticed the CSA went up a little bit in price. Could you explain that? And, you know, Brian and I were both just like, that's what it's worth, you know, because we won't, we won't be willing to, to grow this stuff for anything less because that's exactly what it's worth. And um, ever since then, it's just been, it's gotten better from there. Uh, the quality of food, because we can stay here <laughs> more hours of the day and people come to the farm to pick it up. And, and it really is, it feels like uh, a more sustainable model from when we first started just down the road. It just, everything's gotten better from there. Yeah, it, it really has. I mean, Jess and I still work seven days a week. Um, and there is, uh, which uh, that's for a couple of reasons is that it's, it's not just a, a farm. It's not just a business to us. It's, it's very much of a, of a, you know, a, a financially viable farm and homestead model that we live. We both really enjoy living this lifestyle. We enjoy canning. We enjoy, you know, seeing just how much of our own food that we can put up through the winter um, in order to in order to make things work because the uh, you know although we did get a smoking deal on this property I mean the mortgage is not cheap and and there's there's a certain amount of money that we have to charge um, for the CSA that allows us to make this sustainable and actually makes the work worthwhile so when we raised our prices I mean boy we were we scared you know but we also knew that we would grow bitter that it would change how we felt about our CSA members about our community about our client about farming, uh, about our clients in, in farming. And so if we didn't raise those prices, uh, you know, it just, it just wouldn't have worked. And then, so we bit the bullet and we closed our eyes and we posted the prices on the website and sure enough, the members wanted to know why. And when we explained it to them, they said, all right, let's do this. You know, and, and people jumped on board. And so Chris, you asked that question, like, do we feel like we, you know, after putting in so much infrastructure and in, in labor into the farm, do we feel like we're, we're over it or, or that starting to slow down? It, it is. This has been the first year where I think Jess and I, you know, we just ended the, the probably the hottest and, and uh, probably one of the hardest farming seasons that we've faced as individuals and as a couple. And, you know, we've got energy, right? Right now, you know, we're ready to go. We're excited to go into a winter CSA. Our CSA community is so vibrant right now. And, and, and it's taken years to get there. It's taken a lot of thinning of CSA members um, and uh, to find the really cream of the crop. And now we've got them and we just want to hold on to them and do our best by them. That's a really interesting comment on um, thinning your CSA members. <laughs> um, Uh-oh. Well, and I, and, and, well, and I think there's... It's really apparent when when you look at your guys' online presence that you've really succeeded at creating something there. 
you guys sent me a, an invitation to your CSA member Facebook group, a closed group. And and just looking through there and how engaged your membership is in sharing with you and with each other. And it really seems like you've worked to create a conversation with your members that seems like something that's fairly unusual to me. How, how have you gone about doing that? Well, the, at the very beginning of Brian Nine's relationship, because we kind of met through social media, it was always, you know, a really important communication tool for both of us individually. And so when we came together, um, I was really passionate about the newsletter and keeping people informed. So I wrote a newsletter every single week and I've written a newsletter every single week since the first day that I started at working Hans Farms. So there hasn't been a week during the growing season that I haven't communicated well with our members. And so that was really important for us because, you know, not many people know this, but Brian and I are pretty private people. And so to have, you know, these, uh, social media, like the Instagram and the blog and the newsletter and even through email and stuff like that. It's just, it's so fun to be able to connect with people when they're not on the farm and to feel like they're here with us because they know what we're up to and how their food's being grown and, you know, how we take care of our livestock and how we rotate them around the farm and, and everything else. And it's, that's been a pretty like, at the heart of it, I would say, just and able to communicate with people well. And uh, yeah, I just always felt like it was important to have that connection when people weren't on the farm, especially when we started off when we were driving into Portland. You know, a lot of those people never even came out to the farm. And so now that all of our membership is coming out to the farm once a week, they're seeing the goats, they're seeing their farmers, they're seeing the farm, and and they know that most of their produce is picked for them that morning. So it's they're really connected. And this is probably the first year where, you know, we've really felt like the members have just stepped up, you know, where, you know, and like, uh, it feels like you're pushing them along a little bit and encouraging. Now it really feels like they're holding us up a little bit and there's, you know, more of a balance and, um, they're just so encouraging. Instead of saying, what can the CSA offer me? We're getting questions like, how can we help you guys when, you know, it's been a super hot, challenging season? What can we do for you guys? Can we drop you off a meal? Can we leave you some cookies or some beer? Like what, wh how can we help or encourage you or send you an email that says super hot out still or thinking of you? It's like every step of the way it's, I've seen members this year be moved to tears because they just can't believe how hard or willing to work and work twice as hard in these conditions in order to have a similar amount of produce that we usually have in a normal growing season. It's just been really wonderful. It's just, it, now it feels like the community part is there, you know, which is uh, something we've been kind of anticipating for a while. And I mean, it, there's such a power in, in, I mean, I think about it from our consumer standpoint, you know, from our CSA members, I mean, they, the amount of transparency that comes through social media, cause Jess is exactly right when she said, I mean, we just didn't have the time in the day to, you know, I really admire these folks that have open farms where, where people can come, you know, every hour of the day and come see the farm. But nobody's paying us to stand around and talk. You know, I mean, nobody is paying us to take people on tours that it, it just wasn't sustainable. And so for us, we said, you know, well, let's offer transparency in a different way that allows us to, you know, it takes us two minutes to post something online, you know, where it's like, hey, you know, this is how we weed our carrots or this is how we, you know, uh, rotate our cows. This is how we do whatever it is that we're doing on the farm. This is how we harvest things. This is how we wash things. Things. And it takes a couple seconds and then we post it and throw it out into the world. And then, and people get to say, Hey, look at that. My farmers are harvesting the carrots that I'm going to pick up in four hours from now, you know, or, or eight hours from now. And, and so they get, uh, you know, it's kind of this really powerful, you know, uh, we're not selling them anything. You know, it's like uh, something that we say on the farm all the time is that we, we really don't, you know, uh, our, you don't come to our farm to get a good deal on food. You, you come on to our farm to get what you're paying for. 
And that's exactly what we do with our practices, who is focus on the environment, sustainability, you know, focusing on the farmers, you know, so on and so forth. It's, uh, it's something that we're really proud of. And I love the fact that your CSA members, I'm, I'm just, I'm actually flipping through your Facebook page right now, this, this group. Well, and it's, and, and it's, I mean, it's, it's so cool that they're just like, Hey, this is what we did. You know, here's my green tomato salsa, surprisingly delicious. You know, here's the, here's my Thai red curry with cauliflower. And what a, what a cool thing to have created that has some give and some take to it so that. You know, I think a lot of times when you when we talk about communication on the CSA farm, it ends up being a one way avenue. It's a, you know, we're bringing you these vegetables. Here's the things that you can do with the vegetables. Here's how hard it was on the farm this this week. Here's what the weather was like. And there's not that route for feedback from the customers. And yeah, and I just you know, and I'm back here like on October 22nd. I've gone through 30 posts on your on your CSA on your on your CSA Facebook group with 110 members in the last uh, 10 days. Chris, That's pretty incredible. You hit it, and this has made the biggest difference. I think of all the investments that we've made, this is the one thing that was free that the CSA members largely uh, participate in. If you notice, you don't see a whole lot from Jess and I, maybe one post a week, maybe two at, at the most in yep. the, uh, the Facebook group, because it's really yeah, a, very little. It's a safe place for our members to encourage each other, to, uh, to work with each other, to get ideas if they're struggling to figure out what to do with rutabaga, you know, they, they can encourage each other and let them know what's going on. And the thing that I think gives us, Jess and I energy this fall after such a long season is seeing, it, it's not just seeing the fruits of your labor, it's seeing those fruits of your labor being eaten. And because that's the point, right? If our, and I, you know, earlier on I said, you know, the point, the purpose for Jess and I, our reason to be, on this farm is to make sure that we can feed our community the best produce that we can, the best meat that we can, so they can live more productive lives. And if that's the point and you can't actually see them eating the food, you have to wonder, like, are they getting through the box? Am I giving them too much food? Am I giving them too little food? Do they like the food? And then to actually have a way of witnessing that and seeing it, it, it couldn't be more fulfilling. It's, it, it, it says, okay, you know, where I, I, I think Jess and I have spent time wondering, you know, like, is this the impact that we want to make in this world? For the first time, we actually really have a window to say, yeah, it, it's working, you know, and, and we still get those emails that are, you know, Jess and I, this is the best part, and it's coming up soon, is, is at the end of the season, we always get, you know, a handful of emails or a dozen emails from members who you have no idea what they're facing in their own lives that you know they respect our space and uh, enough to keep it private and at the end of the year they send you an email that says hey i just want to let you know my husband or my wife or my friend or my brother or my neighbor you know is suffering with this ailment this this issue and through eating your produce for the last year the last two years the last three years our lives have gotten better. Their health has improved. And I mean, and it brings Jess and I to tears every time we read them and we go, I had no idea that so-and-so was facing that in their lives. And, and it's actually making a difference. And, and that's the point. I mean, that, that, that's why you work so dang hard. You know, it, it's, it's a wonderful thing. I just love that. Thank you. You're right about the Facebook thing, though, Chris. I mean, it is just that has been the first real true. I mean, other than surveys and all these other things you can do to try to get your feedback from your clients. I mean, that has been extremely meaningful for Jeff and I to uh, to be able to, you know, because you do. You spend a lot of time wondering, is this is this amount of work, you know, seven days a week all day long, it's so physical and it's so taxing on our bodies. Is it really worth it? And then, and you see that and you get those emails and you go like, Oh, there's, uh, you know, I don't want to go back to East Africa. I don't want to go back, you know, to some of the other places that I've worked. I, I, my community's here, you know, it's really great. And, and to have really created that community, I just think is, well, it's, I think it's the biggest challenge that you have on a CSA farm is how to create community. And it's been, it's been hard. I mean, it's the, the community wasn't here. I mean, it wasn't like we, we opened up our doors and said, Hey, Hillsboro, Beaverton, you know, let's do CSA. And they went, Oh yeah, I know what CSA is. And I'm in, they looked at us and said, 
what's CSA? And we said, oh, it's community supported agriculture. And we said, you know, and they go, well, what's that? And then you go, well, yeah, it's kind of a funny acronym, but what it means is, is this, you give all your money to us, you know, or a lump sum of money to us. And then we'll just commit to growing a bunch of food for you and, and you're going to like it. And they, they go, well, that sounds really inconvenient. And, and it doesn't sound like we get to pick out what we want. And yeah, it sounds kind of cool that you get to support some farmers, but yeah, I don't know if we're really into that. And we kind of went, yeah, it may not be a good model for you. And farmer's market may actually be better for you. And they went, well, where do we go from here? And I said, well, give us a try for a year and see, see if it works. You know, I mean, it's really, you, you had to define what CSA was. You had to go through every step of it and slowly you know, you, as you learned, as Jess and I have learned to set more accurate expectations for our, our, for our farm, for ourselves, and for the CSA members, they've really started to go, oh, this is what it's all about. You know, I, you know what, this isn't for me. You know, and it's really that whole power of no thing. You know, as soon as you, because we, we prostrated ourselves. We, we built the street credibility. We, we built the, the relationships in our community where people knew. I mean, you just go through our Facebook and you go, yeah, these guys have worked every single day for the last, you know, three years, five years. It's we know exactly what they're doing. That they they've earned this and uh, this kind of credibility. And then you get to say, you know, you know, I, I'll never forget a conversation I had with a CSA member in in, uh, in the in one greenhouse one early uh, spring, uh, spring. And and I see, you know, when we're talking, getting excited about the CSA, and you know, I'm sort of you know trying to describe it in in flattering terms. And I said, well, do you like tomatoes? We grow a lot of tomatoes. And, and they go, you know, I'm not really into tomatoes. You know, my, my husband doesn't really like them. I don't really like them. And I looked at him and I was like, oh, well, our CSA, mem- you know, our CSA is definitely not for you then because we grow a lot of tomatoes. I mean, our tomatoes are amazing. But if you don't like tomatoes, I'd go to the farmer's market then and support your farmers through there. And then she looked at me and goes, well, then I want to do your CSA. And I went, oh, my goodness. Like <laughs> that, that kind of honesty is, is what's needed in this system and, and appreciated. I really like the idea of what you've done when you talk about prostrating yourself and really <laughs> getting out, getting out there and, you know, trying all of these different ways to sell and then really using that as a mechanism to be able to contract and pull in. Yeah. I think one of the things that oftentimes happens when, when we get started is, you know, we're, we're doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And you know, you're doing some home delivery and farmer's market and some restaurant sales. And then, and then you just keep growing and piling it on. And it actually seems like now what you guys are doing is kind of a, a pulling back in and saying, okay, we've tried all of this stuff. This is what works. And let's, let's focus on what works. Yeah, we've done a we've done a lot of that, and even with the animals too. Like last year, we just were like, "All right, let's try turkeys, let's try poultry," <laughs> or uh, we did some freedom rangers last year, and you know, we've always had the the laying hens and the heritage pigs and the the cows. But last year, we're like, "All right, let's just do it all, see where we're at at the end of the season, and then just you know." trim the fat basically and focus on the areas that, you know, provide fulfillment for us, the farmers, um, and then also to, to help make the business more viable and, um, you know, to have products that the community actually wants or needs. So, you know, and (laughs) turkeys weren't on the list this year, they were really fun to raise, but they just weren't, they weren't a profitable enterprise on the farm for us. And it's just been kind of fun to try out the different things like Brian and I both. All right. It really doesn't hurt to try. I mean, you know, start small, do it the simplest way and see if it works that way. And if it doesn't work that way, you know, you either get rid of the program or figure out a better way to do it. And that's just kind of him and I both are really honest with each other about how things make us feel. And communication is at the heart of it. And eating well is also at the heart of it. So we make sure we have our three meals a day. So we have the the capacity to work the long hours and also to communicate really well with each other um, and be honest about these things. Because like Brian said before, it's, it's, it's our livelihood, it's our business, but it's also a little bit of this homesteader mentality where we utilize a lot of the things in the garden year round. I mean, we keep freezers and canning and, you know, we eat three meals a day off the farm. So it's really important for us to stay connected, but also to, to, uh, I don't know, 
stay true, you know, because there's, there's a fine line and a, a healthy balance of things. And when you work with the same person day in and day out, it's just really important to be, be, be a good person for the other person and to yourself. So. Well, talk to me a little bit about that because one of the reasons why I, sent you guys an email inviting you to do, to, to be on the podcast was because somebody came to me and said, you need to interview these guys about farming as a couple. And, um, I'm really interested. I mean, what, what you just said, that idea of, of even just having, you know, three square meals a day so that you have the energy to be good to the other person. Um, yeah. We look at each other all the time and say, did you eat yet today? Maybe we should go eat and then continue this conversation later. I think this is one of the interesting things that you guys have going on your farm is without employees. You know, Jess, you just talked about looking at, at Brian and saying, hey, have you eaten yet? And <laughs> going and fixing that problem. I think that's something that you really can do in a relationship when there aren't a lot of other people around. You know, you can't just you can't stop at 1030 in the morning and go have late breakfast if you've got a crew of workers there. Chris, you're exactly right. That is at the core of who Jess and I are, and that is eating. That is food. That is being knee deep in 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 the garden and actually making sure that we're fed. Because it is. It's this. This is kind of a bad analogy, but it's the whole airliner. You know, you got to put the oxygen mask over your face before you help the child that's sitting next to you, because you need to make sure that you're conscious of what's going on. And and that's what food is absolutely for us. Is if we're going to work, you know, hundred hour weeks we have to be prepared. We ha our bodies have to be physically fit, which is, you know, actually one of the reasons that we invested in the dairy cow and, and having a little bit more meat on the farm was, was because that we were getting a little too skinny just on vegetables and we were ready, you know, if we're going to work that hard, we needed to actually have the energy to, to do the job is so we can, so our members could feed themselves with our produce. And then, so that is the, the absolutely at the center of it in, in not having employees. And, and we, Jess and I have talked, you know, just back and forth about employees a lot this season because we did start out saying, you know, Hey, let's see how much, let's see what we're capable of doing. Just the two of us. Let's see how far we can go. You know, we don't hire any hourly hourly labor. We, it's just the two of us on this farm. And, and, and so we push that mentality and then, and, you know, now the conversation starting to change and, and we're trying to, you know, plan for the future and plan for a family and decide what does the farm look like if, if uh, you know, one of us is, is unable to work for a small part of time. You know, it's absolutely dependent on the two of us to do everything, especially with the livestock component. So maybe we hire, you know, maybe we get one person or two people and then have them out here and see what that looks like. And, and you know, and, and we may just try to do that. Besides making sure you eat well, what are the structures that you guys have in place for working together as a couple? Um, a lot of it has to, well, just speaking more in the emotional side of things, um, the shared vision is kind of at the heart of it for us. Um, that's kind of what brought us together in the first place um, with farming, but more specifically what our goals were as a farm and as individual farmers. And, um, also the trust aspect um, and the respect. And so working with Brian, I mean, it's completely 50, 50. Um, each one of us goes out there every single day. We've kind of fallen into, uh, I don't know, these like the last couple of years I've taken on more of the greenhouse production side of things. And, and that hasn't been an assigned thing or uh that's where we started. Most of the things when we first started farming together, we were doing uh, all the same things uh, together. And then from there, we've kind of branched off and found these things that both of us really like to do. And um, But at any point in time, we're kind of, either one of us could take over moving the cows or setting up fences or putting the compost spreader on the back of it and spreading it. And uh, we've always had this divide and conquer kind of aspect to the farm where I don't know, that shared vision of like, okay, what needs to get done? These are the things that we'd hope to get done this week. And of course, within that day, things pop up that, you know, you just got to figure out and, and work through it. And, you know, the, the trust and the respect part come in there because 
Brian might not have ever changed something on the, the pump before and looks at me and says, this piece is broken. I think I can fix it. Should I do it? And I say, yeah, you got this because, you know, like, of course he's going to figure it out. And, you know, like, even though we've never experienced it before, it's been very much our experience that, you know, this is how you figure that stuff out. And, you know, just to be an encouragement to somebody else and to encourage them to be a better person. And then in turn, you become a better person as well has just kind of been the natural thing between us where it's like, I respect you. I trust you. You can do this. Um, and it's kind of what we live for, you know, cause that and eating really well, cause it's just, it's what we do every single day. And if, and if we weren't eating really well, and if we weren't taking care of ourselves and if we lost our commu- way of communicating, this just wouldn't be sustainable. And, uh, the partnership, the relationship is at the heart of everything that we do. If that wasn't health, if we weren't in healthy of mind and just, our current state of our relationship. I don't, I don't know if we could farm together full time and, and still enjoy it, you know? So it's, it's been really fun to just kind of get to know somebody so well and in turn have them teach you things about yourself that you never knew you were capable of. I mean, Brian's taught me a lot about power tools and that I'm capable of, of running the (laughs) compost spreader and the tractor and all these things where, I might not have ever gotten that experience otherwise or the encouragement, you know, um, Brian's just a really great person to be around. And, uh, I just feel thankful that farming is what brought us together and that the thing that we can excel at with each other. Well, I think building off of what Jess is saying is that, you know, I don't know if you've had this experience in a relationship, Chris, uh, that when you, when there's two right ways of accomplishing a single task and you know, there's two right ways of doing it, but you think your way is that much more right. And then, so, and I look at Jess, and I'm like, you know what? I think I know the best way of doing this, but I chose Jess as my partner because she is smart. She is talented. She sees solutions to problems that I would never see. So I'm just going to default to the partner because I trust her. Even though if I think I'm just so sure I'm, I've got the best way of doing it. And, and of course, you know, what happens is she does it her way. And I'm like, I would have never thought of that. And that was so much better than the idea that I had. And, and gather, I'm, I'm trying to do a better job all the time of actually doing that, but it really, and, and then all of a sudden I'm free to go focus on other things. Cause I don't have to be the only one with the solutions that Jess, my totally capable and beautiful partner is, is, you know, is somebody gave me a, a piece of business advice and they said, you know, make sure that you're not the smartest one in your company, you know, make sure you're hiring people that are smarter than you. And, and like, thankfully I have a partner who has absolutely achieved that. And so when we work together, it, it really, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's not as stressful as I think it could be if I felt like I had to be responsible of doing, of coming up with all these creative solutions and, and problem solving. So it is, I mean, it is, it, Jess and I talked about this, you know, how we were going to answer this question, you know, of, of how we work together and, and some, we, we wanted some really practical, you know, uh, this is exactly what we do and, and what's come out of our conversations and our reflection on it over the last few days is, is really, it's, it, there's nothing concrete. It's, it's that we, we work on communication every single day and we work on making sure that, I don't know, that, like Jess said, that trust element and that, that relationship element. And that our needs are being met. That's right. And that we're eating well. I mean, that is, that is the basis of, of how we function and survive working as much as we do on this, on this farm. I just love that. Let's, let's, let's take this as an opportunity to turn to the lightning round because that was perfect. And I think the first question we're going to ask in the lightning round then is what did you guys have for breakfast? <laughs> we actually had a arugula green salad with a homemade dressing and a couple of poached eggs on top. So we had that just before we, we jumped on the horn with you. Jess, what's your favorite tool on the farm? Oh, man, I've been debating this one. There's, we've invested in a lot of fun little tools this year, like a jank seeder and a flame weeder. And I just, I think the practical side of me says, though, just the good old forks on the front of the tractor. I mean, that tractor is, 
is, is our, our arms and everything when we can't lift things or, I mean, materials handlers, right? So I'd have to see the forks on the front of the tractor. How about you, Brian? Oh, my favorite tool on the farm. It, <laughs> it is. I mean, we, we certainly have a certain affection for tools. Um, and Especially and, you, I would say. <laughs> maybe I do. <laughs> um, you know, we... I think the flame weeder, you know, we, we had some friends, uh, that are just great builders, uh, some family friends, and they, they built us a really nice looking flame weeder that covers a, a 36 inch bed top. And, uh, and it is just... Uh, it's changed everything. Well, we've had the farm long enough now where it's, you know, our our, our mistakes are really starting to show. You know, I mean, at first, uh, <laughs> when you plant carrots, then no, you know, you just turn it tilled in pasture and no weeds come up. And you go, oh my goodness, I hit the jackpot. This farm is amazing. Well, it doesn't look like that anymore. Now, now right. you, <laughs> you till in the, uh, you know, the old crops and then, you know, you watch all the pigweed and lamb's quarter and amaranth, you know, and everything else start to pop up and you go how do I deal with that I never had to face that and it's too dang hot to have to deal with these weeds all day long and and so the flame weeder you know doing the pre-emergence flaming you know and we got the idea from is both Elliot Coleman as well as uh, JM reinforced it and we said we got to figure out how to get one of these things and and it was just amazing to actually you know you, you, the the, the beets the carrots are germinating and there's no weeds all of a sudden around them you know and it saves you a whole first pass of weeding and then we always look at it and we think okay if we had to hire somebody to do that in the future how many hours of labor would have it taken to to hand weed all that all that and you know we know that with one propane cylinder we can do you know four or five of our beds and then so that actually ended up only costing about five dollars to save one entire pass when we're weeding and we go now that's efficiency you know that is that's a beautiful tool so yeah i'd say the flame weeder cool and uh, and jess what's your favorite crop to grow my favorite crop to grow, gosh, there's so many. I've, I've been having a lot of fun with the crops that we've, uh, haven't had as much success with the, every year. I try to take on at least three crops that I want to improve upon. Uh, and, but I have to say, I think beets is my favorite thing to grow. I know, I know. I want to say some of the other things I've had a lot of success with this year, like broccoli and spinach and cauliflower, but, um, Beets are just—I don't know. There's something about the beet that I really, really enjoy, and I love eating them. So that's probably it too. And our members love eating them too. So it's the provider in me, just kind of—I—I like growing the things that people naturally love. So. Do you guys are you guys Tom Robbins fans? Oh, see, that's the thing. <laughs> I read all of his novels. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you talk about the blackberries taking over the barn and now the beets. I can just I can sort of see you guys living out this Tom Robbins novel there <laughs> oh, in, up in the Pacific Northwest. So, OK, <laughs> well, you know, can I chime in real quick? We actually did at some point in time, we did want to uh, uh, interject something from the written word. And then so we actually had just a small excerpt from a Wendell Berry poem um, for you. And, uh, and then do you mind if I read it real quick? Go right ahead. <laughs> okay. And then so, uh, yeah. Here, one second. Okay, this is from The Contrariness of the Mad Farmer by Wendell Berry. And it's just the beginning of it. It says, I am done with apologies. If contrariness is my inheritance and destiny, so be it. If it is my mission to go in at exits and come out at entrances, so be it. I have planted by the stars in defiance of the experts and tilled somewhat by incantation and by signing and reaped as I knew by luck and heaven's favor in spite of the best advice. That really sums up who Jess and I are as farmers, that it's that you have to put your hands in everything. You have to try everything at least once. You have to figure it out for yourself because you don't know if people have been doing this the wrong way for a really long time and you you just want to dive in and, and see see for yourself. And sometimes, you know, people do things for a reason and you don't have to reinvent the wheel over and over again. And sometimes, you know, what you have is unique, you know, and, and farms are so unique. And our, what works on our farm 
isn't going to work on all the other farms. And it's really special to say, hey, that's that's unique for everybody and it's empowering. So go ahead and experiment, you know, get creative and try things. And if they don't work, listen. And if they do work, oh, go forth and conquer. <laughs> I love it. I, I don't know that I've ever that I've ever seen somebody draw that line between Tom Robbins and Wendell Berry before, but there it is, <laughs> right true. there. Uh, oh. They're all so connected. It is just, I mean, they're inextricably linked in the most powerful ways. And it's and and, and the the connection there is is you know knowing what, what you know what a beat's made of. You know, when you open that up, and it's not you don't need a scientific answer. You open it up, and you can't help but see that that's blood, and that's a heart, and that's you know, these things that really move you in the same way, you, know, you listen to Wendell Berry talk about, you know, the trees dying on the Kentucky River and you just, you know, he, he sees the exact same thing when he opens up a beat. You know he does. <laughs> That's great. All right. Hey, so what was the last purely recreational activity you guys did? <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Is building the house? Uh, no, I... doesn't count. <laughs> oh God! I think we went for a hike a couple of years ago. <laughs> we went for a day hike. Is that really the last? No, last winter we took the dogs for a walk at the park. Yeah, we that... did do that. Okay. Yeah, you guys are putting in some serious hours. So. <laughs> it was a good walk though, and they're just little pups then. It was really fun. <laughs> And what's your favorite resource to turn to when you have ans- when you need answers to questions that you don't have? Oh man, um, the first thing that I think of is is probably Instagram. We ha- we've met a lot of great farmers uh, through that network, and it's just been super fun to kind of. I always take screenshots of people asking questions, and they get all these answers. And so I kind of have a bunch of these pictures saved, or if we have thoughts, or you know. This uh, spring, a bunch of earthworms are pulling our onion tops underground, and all the onions are upside down out in the ground, and we had to keep replanting, you know, 20,000 onions. It was just like, okay, anybody have any advice on what to do in this situation? And, you know, all of the, the farmers that we know across the north or northeast and midwest and on the pacific northwest kind of chimed in and it just feels good to commiserate a little bit because it's in real time and so you know like we learned this year more than any other year you know these are the things that aren't really talked about you know it's a hardship like you you know it's you just kind of want to paint a more positive picture because you don't want to come off as being negative or any of these other things. And this was the first year where Brian and I were just like, I got to be honest, like this hasn't been a really easy year. How is everybody else handling the weather or, you know, like people back in the Northeast, they had snow on the ground up until April or May, like, how are you guys doing? And so to just be able to check in with each other and offer advice or just, you know, gain some perspective on, man, it's hot and dry here, but we're not getting five inches every couple of days like they are in Georgia or wherever. It's just like, that's kind of been a huge resource for us and, and commiserating and, (laughs) and just like supporting other farmers. Um, because, you know, we have a lot of community members, but we don't necessarily have a lot of friends. And so most of our friends that we're gaining over the last couple of years are farmers. And it's just been a really um, beautiful resource in order to like real time connections with people who may be going through something similar to you and, and have something to, to gain from that or offer. And I'd add to that is a lot of it's technical too, is that it's, it's, it's both that uh, ability to commiserate and to, part, you know, kind of uh, have those conversations with the others to try to figure out some of these solutions. And, and finally, Jan, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Jeff, you go first. Okay. Mine would definitely be uh, ask for what you need. Because I'm the type of person that overthinks things constantly and to a, to a fault maybe. And so, you know, when asking for what we need in order to make a livable wage uh, that year was really tough for me because I knew it was worth it. Um, and But it was really hard for me to just kind of put myself out there for for many reasons. So I think asking for what you need and and just, you know, 
going with the flow and not not creating too much fear because everything all works out and that's something that Brian has definitely uh, yeah shown me. And you, Brian? I meet Jess sooner. You know, maybe. maybe <laughs> no, that would be. The <laughs> I love it. Hey, uh, I, I I do. I mean, it's like uh, I I I really don't have any regrets. I, I wouldn't do anything differently, to be honest. I every every you know every time I've really been scared on the farm or really worried. Um, each one of those moments has taught me something important about being alive and experiencing this world for what it has to offer. And uh, it's, maybe it's a little bit of a lame answer, but I, I really wouldn't change a thing. I mean, each, I've just learned so much and I've been so thankful to have a community that's willing to support us and, and allow us to, you know, I mean, somebody has got to have their hands in the dirt, you know, if we're going to make this whole world a little bit better, you know, somebody has got to be figuring it out. And that's going to take a lot of lessons, you know, as we become more and more disconnected from, from, you know, our, our heritage, uh, you know, it feels like it's starting to move in the other direction because of so many you know, farmers that have come before us and that Jess and I are lucky enough to glean, you know, what they've learned and what they've taken the time to publish in books. And then we get to take it and then move it forward. And, and, but no matter how much you book learning you do, you know, you, you still have to experience it. And, and that's always scary. So just, I, I think just, just believe in yourself and go forward. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't change a thing. Jess and Brian, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you taking a break here in, in early November and talking to us about your farm and, and your background and, and your guys' relationship with such honesty. That was really fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for uh, putting together the Farmer to Farmer podcast. We really enjoy all the work that you do. Yeah, thank you, Chris. It, it really means a lot. What you're doing is uh, is making a big difference in the lives of a lot of farmers. So it's absolutely our pleasure to participate. And uh, and thanks for thanks for thinking of us. Thank you so much, you guys. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 40 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast, and that you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for powers. That's P O W E R S. It's been a while since I made a big deal about it, but I really work hard to make the show notes on farmer to farmer podcast.com a valuable resource by providing quotes from the show and links to the resources that are mentioned in the course of the conversation. If you enjoy the podcast, I think you would also enjoy my weekly newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga. The Flying Rutabaga runs the gamut from practical templates for delegation to guidelines for watering transplants. You can sign up at farmer to farmer podcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. Also, if you enjoy the show, it would be great if you would pop on over to iTunes to leave us a review or make a comment on the show notes or tell your friends on Facebook. These reviews and referrals are the bread and butter of making this show available to an ever wider group of listeners. And you know what else? I'd love to hear your suggestions for guests on the show. In fact, the only reason I had Jess and Brian Powers on the show, the only reason I even knew Jess and Brian Powers existed was because a listener reached out and said, you should really talk to these people. I know a lot of things, but I don't know all of the great farmers out there, and I don't know who's got the great stories. Please visit farmer to farmer podcast.com and use the contact form to tell me who you'd like to hear. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.